application. So sorry for the again for the delay. Right to the place. So uh, the lecture today is actually about the compiler application. So it's actually a lecture of mechatronics. So before starting, uh, it would be good to also to check for you. I mean, uh, how many of you are actually computer science? How many are the mechanical engineers? And, and uh, so those that are let's say mechatronics or mechanical engineers will be right now. Okay, so there are only a few, that's it. Okay, so this will be uh, kind of, uh, uh, let's say, very different from what uh, your expected is, but uh, I'll try to explain it. Of course, you can stop me in, in any case and uh, ask all the questions. So, um, very briefly, the outline is basically we'll do some uh, short introduction of classical robotics actuation. We'll discuss the, uh, the advances and advantages of the, of the, of the traditional and say, robotics actuation technology. And then we move forward to the introduction of the compliant activators. Uh, there we spend some time uh, to show some details on the, on the particular the series of last activators to fix the transistor and transmission system. We introduce uh, in details the combat unit is, is, is an activator that developed an IIT for our new department. And actually, we saw that how do we integrate this to the to, to form a community from a new platform. Particularly, we discuss some details on how to tune the, uh, the elasticity of transmission in such a multi of uh, mass spring system in order to achieve certain performance. And following this, I, I, I will talk about the, uh, the extension of this uh, fixed uh, elasticity actuators towards the uh, actuators that can actually regulate the, the elasticity of the transmission at the, at the, uh, at the, at the mechanism level, not by using the load cells and, and, and torque and roll, but actually by modifying the mechanism. Then at the end, there is a time we extend also uh, this kind of particular uh, family of operators adding uh, additional fiscal principles that like uh, the variable damping to, to form complete units that can regulate the, the, the compliance but also the damping at the mechanism level. Okay, so uh, okay, this is a robot uh, uh, soccer let's say workshop, so it would be good to be inspired by, by looking at this video and actually ask you to see but uh, the, the difference that you observe uh, between these videos on the bottom, though you saw that actually the current state of the performance on the, on the robot uh, soccer, uh, and also the, the, the performance that you see here on the, on the football that is uh, 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 played by humans. So uh, basically, you can see a few fundamental differences that uh, makes the, these two uh, videos uh, look, to look very different than the, the one on the top. First of all, you could, here you can see only that uh, robots can move relatively slow. Okay, this is actually fast forward, but when they, you play at the normal speed, the, the, the motions are relatively slow compared to what you see on, on the real football. You have, uh, uh, therefore, uh, the lack of any fast or high power motions. This is, of course, because the, um, uh, the systems are not uh, robust enough to, to execute these motions and to impose uh, damage to, 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 to the operator uh, and the general the device. You have always static balancing, so the robots are always maintain the balance. While here you can see that the person actually almost losing the balance, but still trying to execute uh, and keep the ball. And uh, of course, you have a complete lack of the physical game, so there is no actually like, interaction between the robots. And even if the robots they try to interact, they usually the operators will try to keep them away in order to prevent again the, the damage to the robot. So there is no uh, physical game, which uh, makes a big difference uh, when you compare the, the, the videos in the bottom and the videos. So, um, uh, of course, this is actually, uh, uh, let's say, the robots that you see before are actually low-cost relative low-cost robots that are used in, in uh, software teams. But actually, what, uh, what I say before is actually true also for the high-performance robot. So you can see here, uh, again, some uh, demonstrations of the, of the state of the art manuals, the ASIMO, the, uh, the HRT robot, but also the, uh, the first one at the bottom, that they have uh, certain uh, skills in terms of promotion. They can work well in very flat terrains where there are no perturbations. They can actually perform some manipulation actions. They can actually they all even perform some whole body planning uh, motions, plan motions, uh, as you can see here the HRP. Or uh, uh, recently, the APETMA has demonstrated also the, the interaction, um, uh, the physical interaction uh, of the environment, which you cannot see actually in any of the other robots. So they, they, they have capabilities that, uh, as I say, are limited to, uh, uh, to the operations with the well. Uh, uh, defined environment. So the flat, the, the, the floor needs to be flat. The manipulation here is done with pre uh, knowing the pre precise the position of the objects. Here, the motion planning actually is done uh, offline and play back to the robot with the robot knowing exactly the constraints. And any small variation on, on the on these constraints will basically make the robot fail. 
So I think what we are missing, apart from the uh, again from Batman here that we must play the first time, is actually a, a bit of this robust interact with the structural environments. So this is not possible actually, and there is a strict rule of the, all these robots that basically say that we do not uh, touch and do not start these robots, because they will fail. So it, as I say, it's true also for high performance robots, it's not only true for us, for, for now and the small scale robots. It, this is true for all, all, all robots, even if the of the action uh, considers the state of the action humanity. So, uh, what is the problem? I mean, there are several problems, of course, starting from the control, the perception, but uh, going down to the, to the, to, uh, also to the, to the, uh, to the fundamental uh, uh, components that uh, form the, the physical body of the robot. And one of these, it's very important, is actually the actuation system. And traditionally, in robotics, especially if we uh, only focus on the motorized versions of actuators, there are, um, uh, you can distinguish or categorize the actuators two main, uh, 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 let's say, uh, Categories, which is actually the direct drive systems and the gear actuators, which can be formed by model, it's in a, a gearbox uh, and or a motor or the low friction cable uh, belt transmission system. So let's see what are the advantages and advantages of, of these systems. So starting from the direct uh, drive actuation, this is actually uh, basically uh, a single motor without any any uh, any gearbox is used directly to, to, to apply the load to support the load in, in, in the output. So you can see here this is usually formed by a very high quality. A uh, torque motor that can uh, run at low speeds and produce uh, a high torque without, without any reduction drive to reduce the speed and increase the, the torque output. It's very, very simple actuator. It has the advantage that it is, since there is no any, any transmission systems, you have a, a perfect torque source. So you can actually command uh, by doing the current regulation the output torque, torque of the actuator and uh, uh, achieve a very high fidelity torque on board. It also is robust against the impact, which you don't have if you have a gearbox but it's always uh, prone to damage under the uh, 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 high impact forces. But also there are disadvantages. But, uh, the disadvantages actually usually in robotics, we, uh, the trajectories that you generate are relatively low speeds and you require relatively high torques. And uh, uh, motors that uh, actually operate at low speeds are usually inefficient. Because, so usually when selecting the uh, direct drive system, what you do is actually you, you select a, a system with a power specification that's much higher than the, the power you want to achieve. In, because, and this is because it, it needs to run at low speeds since there is no gear reduction, and this is actually rather inefficient. So they are typically uh, also very uh, large and heavy. Uh, the power to weight ratio of the electromechanical actuators is not high enough to produce systems that can generate high torque capability within a certain uh, uh, volume and mass. So uh, this basically the last two events to, to have systems that can be lightweight, uh, and of course uh, uh, this. This increase then uh, in, in, in uh, the, the, the requirements for, for talk when you build robots with direct uh, drive. So there are, there, there are, uh, it seems like an ideal actuator that you can have a really uh, good force of uh, top control and a very robust against impacts, but still we are lacking the uh, uh, power to weight ratio performance that we need in order to use effectively this uh, kind of uh, actuator systems. Now moving to the, to the gear drive, so basically this is actually an extension of the, of the previous run where a servo motor is combined with the gear actuator. And, and the reason is that, that, is that basically in order to, uh, to match better the requirements of the trajectory that you see in robotics, which are usually lower speed and, and higher torque. So the reduction gear, what it's doing is actually reducing the speed and increasing the torque at the output, while the robot is still running at a higher speed, which is actually more efficient in this case. So, uh, uh, of course, I mean, we gain some advantages there uh, in terms of efficiency at the motor side, but actually we lose also uh, uh, things in terms of efficiency since the, 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 the drive scars also, the, the reduction drive scars also friction. And this is uh, uh, adds on the, on the losses that are uh, on, on, on the drive. Also, um, uh, the current control that I mentioned before that can be used to, 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 to control the torque is still can be used in this case, but only for low gear. Ratio. Um, as you see in the next slide, some of you know, the disadvantages of the, the gear drive is actually the very nonlinear um, uh, dynamics they have. They have backlash, they have uh, extinction and friction that makes it difficult to uh, basically to control uh, the, the torque of the motor uh, using the, the torque in the output using the, the current if the gear ratio increases. Uh, so it can work actually still the current control to, 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 to do some torque control in the output uh, by using the current but only for low gear. Uh, as I mentioned already, it has, they have linear, not continuous dynamics and sticks on the backlash, which means it's very difficult to model and also to compensate this when we do the top control. So the fidelity you get from the force is not very good, 
uh, unless, as you say, the, the gearing is very low and you still have a battery capability, and uh, these effects are, 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 are minimized. And the last but the important also uh, and advantage is actually that the, this kind of uh, combination of uh, application system that combines the, the gear box and the motor is actually very quick under impacts. Um, so usually the, the first component that will break if you have an impact in the robot will be basically the 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 the, 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 uh, the induction drive. An alternative to, to produce some uh, let's say gear on the on the application system on the motor is actually to use a, a cable transmission system and. In this case, you basically you replace the, the gearbox and the base from, from, from uh, uh, gear components with a, a combination of cables and pulleys that allows you to implement some reduction in, in the transmission. It has certain advantages compared to the previous solution that is actually can be approximated quite linear the model, so it means you can compensate. It has low very low friction, so it's actually even if you increase the area, you have still have the, uh, the battery availability. And this is uh, it's more robust. Uh, of course, then also the other impacts you, you can. Uh, uh, break the cables and, uh, and, uh, and the connections, the cables and the pulleys, but, but still there's a uh, uh, system elastic, the elastic that, uh, that uh, there's a, in a cable transmission uh, uh, can assist this. They are, they are still, um, uh, I would say, more, more robust against the, the impacts. Um, so uh, there, there are several advantages, but I mean, there are also disadvantages, which is basically to implement uh, 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 such a kind of transmission system, you need a number of pulleys, as I say. And in order to reach a high gear, you need to have a, a big pulley, some diameter, a small pulley, diameter that needs to be combined, in, possibly in a multi-stage system, uh, to produce a high gearing uh, in this kind of uh, uh, transmission. So this, of course, takes space, and you can end up with a very uh, uh, big designs and uh, that are not practical. Um, also, the assembly is more complex, uh, and um, you, you have to, uh, to supply the, all the fixation of the cable, you have to fixation the cables depending on, on the level of the load you have. And so here you can see an example to, to, to see the number and the food that we need uh, to do this kind of configuration transmission in a very simple R. Uh, in, in addition to actually to, um, uh, to the number of pulleys, you need also uh, that are connected to the cable, you need always additional pulleys to, to drive the cables to the joints. So it's quite complicated, but it's actually a good solution that usually applies to the system that you drive low gear in relative low gear, so the transmission can be implemented with a pair of pulleys, a small and a big pulley. It is actually very popular in systems like, uh, uh, for those that you are aware, like uh, uh, public devices and force feedback uh, devices where you require the, the very low friction uh, uh, from the transmission system. So, uh, moving now to the humanoid actuation, uh, after having this uh, classification of the robotic actuation, we can see that the predominant actuation that using the humanoid is actually combined uh, the second solution that you see I have used before. So this is basically a combination of motors with the gear there. Usually, the, 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 these groups they have high gearing, so more than 101. I would say 101 is actually relatively moderate. Usually, uh, humanoids they go up to 300 and 400 to 1, which means that uh, they are completely non uh, back driver due to the high friction on the, the transmission system. In addition to, the, to this uh, non back capability, actually, this is a control loop also with, the, with the control loops that are based on position velocity. That makes uh, this, uh, this uh, joints of, uh, even more speed from, from the control point of view. Um, they have minimum pass for dynas, unless you have somewhere some belt or some uh, cable transmission that's combined with the vehicle, that, that uh, some uh, um, elasticity is actually introduced uh, from, the, from the states. And in general, there is no torque sensing, which means that it's very difficult to do any torque control in the output. Uh, as I say, the, the current control option is not, uh, is not there basically because you cannot actually compensate for the, for the nonlinear dynamics and the, and the uh, normal capability of the, of the, of the, of the motor. So always the friction will be there, and the fidelity that you are going to get is not going to be good. Of course, there's, there are some examples, but I mean, you can count in, in one hand of robots that they introduce this, uh, this uh, uh, low cell capability that allows you to do the top control in, in these robots. Uh, but as I say, the tradition is actually uh, mostly on uh, using steel position and velocity. The advantage of the robot, they have a high distance Stubbers detection, so they basically they detect any any load variation. They, they precisely track the, the position that you send or the velocity trajectory reference uh, trajectory, as uh, also uh, traditional industrial robots would do. Now, I, so far I actually exclude computer hydraulic uh, 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 actuation, uh, uh, more more focusing on, on the electrical system, mostly because. Uh, um, uh, I, I see that the hydraulic actuation, although they, they actually fundamentally they, they are based on very different technologies than the electrical system, 
they basically both are actually a, a stiff equation. So both hydraulic and electric with gear motors uh, are actually stiff equations. The difference is actually mostly on the performance that you get from the hydraulic system. So, uh, where it's basically you have better, ba higher bandwidth, they are faster, you can do uh, faster top on road and, and give some advantage. But of course, there are also uh, uh, many disadvantages on, on this kind of operation compared to the electric motors, which is, uh, just to mention two is basically the uh, very, uh, very high um, uh, safety concerns that are from these systems, they are very, very powerful, but also they, uh, they are very inefficient uh, in terms of energy. Uh, consumption. So, uh, so I, I will not go into test this time in the this in on hydrology, but actually, um, this was just to, 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 to show here that basically, although they are based on very different uh, technologies, they are actually fundamentally uh, following the same principle of actuation. They are, uh, they are stiffly natural, and then by control, you can actually make, make can make both compliant if you have a low cell either in the output of the, of the motorized joint or in the output of the hydraulic joint. Okay, this is very different uh, from what uh, uh, you see actually in the biological masses, uh, on the biological uh, equation, particularly the mass, where uh, usually um, uh, the natural of these actuators is actually soft. So it's, instead of starting from a stiff principle, the natural of these actuators is soft. Usually there are more than one mass, usually in, in robotics we see basically a, a single actuator to, to command the position, velocity or torque of the, of the joint. While in humans or other biological systems, there are a number of, of uh, actuators that are used to power it on. So at minimum, I would say two, uh, and, but in, in, in many cases, there are also additional mass, mass that are actually um, uh, connected between the, uh, the, the balls to, to activate the, the, the joints. Since the uh, software are very robust, so they, they, they against the, uh, the impacts, and uh, the elasticity that is included in this kind of package allow us also to store some, some amount of energy that you can actually reduce to generate, let's say, for example, a high power motion for when you do some throwing and kicking, um, you can achieve velocities at, 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 at the joints of the legs or at the, at the joints of the arm uh, that are go much higher than what you can achieve with the steam actuator. And they are very high adapted to load, so even if you have, you don't know the, the precise the location, the, the constellation of the environment, when you perform manipulation, uh, uh, then you can easily adapt and be stable on, on the interaction with the interaction with the load package. So, uh, why do we need compliance also in robotics? So, we expect that, I mean, the, the socket is a good ex example of, of, a, of, of, a, of a, a, an application that uh, robots do need to interact in, in, in environments that are not well defined. So, so far, actually, most of the demonstrations that we've done in robotics are done in, in well-defined environments inside the lab spaces where you know all the constraints, you, you know all the parameters of your experiment, you do the experiment, the robot performs well. Anything that will be very different and uh, during the execution will make the robot fail. But of course, to, to, uh, uh, to look for uh, real practical applications and bring the robots to uh, real uh, uh, environments and the operating tools that the humans of, uh, they can operate and, uh, and the interfacing with the our world, we need to have robots that can actually cope with these situations. So accuracy and repeatability that actually uh, are the advantage of this application, maybe are still necessary, but maybe it's, it's not actually the, uh, uh, the, the highest priority in the case. What we need more is actually adaptability to interactions at the world body level, so ability to cope with the perturbations, external disturbances, uncertainties in human interactions, and so on. And this is at least of uh, uh, equal importance uh, uh, together with accuracy and repeatability. Uh, so, how to, to satisfy the requirements? One way is actually the traditional way, which we already mentioned, that uh, you have a stiff body application for accuracy, and then you have uh, some uh, uh, force sensor or torque sensor that you do have to control. The control or force control to satisfy the new requirements and, and, and improve the adaptability of the, of the robot during the interaction. This will work well if you have a, a, a slow uh, kind of interaction, uh, which means that the active control that we have there will be able to, to cope with the, with the, with the transients of the impact forces. But we fail completely if you have accidental collisions and, and, and uh, let's say, a robot falling, falling down or accidentally damage collide with the environment. And this is due to the delay that you have always in the, in, the, in the sensing part, in the perception part of the robot, that it can be of the, of the, of the order of a few milliseconds from, uh, from the time that you have the collision, the impact, and the time that the sensor detects the signal, depending on the location where the sensor is. And also some delay on the control loop that will add to this. Before you have the first reaction, you see the first reaction from the robot to, to adapt to the disturbance. So we work well within a certain speed of, of uh, uh, interaction. Uh, but we fail completely and we will not protect the, the robot uh, during accidental events. 
Uh, the second solution is basically to, to go for the opposite, uh, let's say, design uh, principle where the body is designed to be compliant, so it's actually intrinsically compliant, soft, and then you, you know, uh, to use the control to, to, uh, to achieve the performance index that you need that you lose with the introduction of compliance. For example, the accuracy and repeatability will not be uh, the same in, in the case of the intrinsically soft robot. So this would be uh, uh, reduced and not to bring back and uh, it's a certain level that uh, is required for the task to apply the control. So it's completely the opposite actually way of, of uh, designing the robot, uh, uh, reversing the, 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 the body design risk from the stiff to, to, the, to the soft and then use the, the control to, to achieve back the performance that we need in terms of the position of the cabin. Now by reducing the compliance we, we have a set of benefits um, uh, have uh, lower impact forces, improves uh, robustness, we have passive adaptability to interaction, we can use the compliance to store uh, and release energy and to um, uh, this allows to, to generate higher velocity on the links, which increases the electric power capability of the robot. And we can in theory actually also recycle this uh, energy to, to, uh, to improve energy efficiency. So from, uh, from periodic motion for motion, but also for the CR motion, you can possibly actually use this, this uh, uh, storing and release uh, energy uh, side to, 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 to improve the, the robot capacity. Now today we are going to speak more about the, the impact forces, the adaptability with some some from the chroma humanoid and uh, also with touch the energy efficiency. Uh, and so the one and two and four basic benefits that we get uh, from, from the compliance. So uh, let me introduce now the, the first actually uh, I mean Compliant transmissions were, were actually existed even before the introduction of the series elastic actuator that was uh, in, in this kind of principle that was introduced by, by Pratt in 1995. But um, uh, uh, prior to this time, such a compliance was considered as a bad thing to have in the robot. And this was because, the, as I said before, you lose accuracy, you lose the ability, and the robot cannot perform uh, thinking of traditional tasks task that executed in, in industrial environments. What actually was the difference that actually brought the uh, Pratt, they say, proposed uh, uh, the importance of insertion actually uh, uh, of the series elasticity between the, the lower and the and the and the, and the actuator in order to improve the, the, uh, the performance of the robot uh, in, 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 the, in the terms I mentioned before, adaptability and passive risk of adaptability and so on. So this is actually basically the principle. You have a, uh, the actuator, uh, here actually it's also of the of the, of the of uh, force uh, uh, loop. Um, so you have the operator and you have the, the series elastic uh, transmission that is inserted between the, the motor and, and the load. And then you can actually <laughs> utilize also this uh, elastic transmission by measuring the displacement of the force to close the loop and modulate the, the force in, in the in the hour. So um, advantages pass the adapter. So basically any any external load or perturbation will make this uh, joint to move basically and adapt to, to the external operation. Uh, forces are lower, so the, the springs acts, uh, uh, acts uh, uh, as a mechanical filter that actually uh, reduces the, the, the impact forces. But the reduction of the impact for forces it, uh, uh, it comes also from the fact that actually the springs, what it's doing is basically decouples the, uh, the inertia of the actuator and the, from the inertia of the lower. So uh, during impact, what, uh, uh, the peak of the impact is mostly now generated by the, by the inertia that is actually at the links side, which is basically the lower, the black tube here. While the, the effect of the, of the inertia of the, of the drive is not is reduced since this is the gap from the output. Is this here? Because the uh, impact force are reduced, then the system is, is safe, both for the environment but also for the, for the robot itself, so it's actually more robust. And as you saw in this, uh, in, in this scheme, it can be combined also with, um, um, uh, with the force sensing to perform uh, in vitals or active speedness regulation. Here you can see some examples of, the, of this kind of drives. Uh, this is the, one of the first, the first actually uh, series elastic actuator that uh, I will give you some more details later. The same, the same is, is used here for the antiprosthesis. Here is, is a kind of different uh, 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 arrangement where the, uh, uh, you see the springs that are actually in series with the tendon transmission system that are, are remotely activated the, the joint uh, uh, with the motors placed on the other side of the road of the link. But let, let's see, let's say some of the, uh, uh, how these actuators are made. So this, as I say, is the first one actually introduced in 95, and basically try to replicate a prismatic actuator, uh, like a mass that is actually soft. 
So in Compose with the, with the two, um, uh, uh, from two main, main components, so you have a, the servo motor at the back, and then you have a, a linear drive, which is actually a ball screw drive, um, as you can see here, with an up uh, of the drive uh, here in the middle. And then you have the, the, the output carriage that is actually consists of two plates, and this is the output that when the forces are checked. And uh, basically the splits uh, provides the coupling between the nut of the ball screw uh, through this plate and the, and the, and the output carriage. So if you try to perturb actually the output carriage, then you are going to compress one or the other side of the splits depending on the direction of the applied or what. So the, even if the motor is controlling in position, uh, control and it's actually stiff, still you have, uh, you have a passive adaptation to the, to the external perturbation to the, the, the inserted elasticity. Okay, so uh, as I said, one of the, of the, um, uh, of the uh, important and the advantages that we get from, the, from this kind of operators is actually the, the reduction of the impact forces. So let's see how these effects you can uh, uh, improve uh, by using the compliance. Uh, so, uh, compliance usually can be produced in the, in the, in the, in the robot joint by, by using um, different ways. So, in the previous uh, actuators, you see that actually the, the spring was inserted between the motor, the mesh of the motor, and the actually and the and the output load. But there are also uh, a, a different approach that you can actually uh, use uh, the, the elastic element to form a cover in the, in the, in the body of the robot. And in this case, uh, still uh, you, you maintain the lead connection between the, the motor and the lead, but you, you introduce the, the passive layer between the, the yeah, externally out, outside the surface of the, of the robot body. So in case of collision, this will provide the, 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 the fit and the impact forces. Of course, you can combine also the two cases. So you can have, say, the elastic transmission uh, with the, with the uh, mass of the lead here, the, the motor again, the first spring that here that is actually represents the elastic transmission, and the second spring here that represents the cover of the robot. So uh, doing a sim uh, simulation, you can see here, for example, uh, the what you get uh, on the effect of the impact forces uh, for, the, for the different cases. So, mind here that A is the case that you have the, the elasticity in the transmission system, B is the, where you have the elasticity on the cover, and A and B is actually the combined. Um, so you see that the, uh, actually the, the effect is greater on the reduction on the impact forces when uh, the, the elasticity is actually uh, on the transmission system. So between the, 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 the lower inertia and the, the, the motor inertia. And uh, to repeat here that the main difference is actually that on, on this approach is actually you do this initial decoupling between the, uh, the, the external load and the operator side. And this is what is actually helps uh, mostly to minimize the impact forces. You can see some effect because of the cover here. Uh, if you introduce also the, the, the B, uh, the B scenario where you, you do also the cover, you can see that uh, from below 20,000 uh, newtons per, per meter stiffness, which is like a soft plastic. Uh, uh, you can actually have some reduction in the impact forces, but it's actually very, very minimal. And also in the cover, uh, what is um, um, uh, usually uh, problematic is that you need a quite a thick layer uh, uh, if you want to have a substantial displacement during the impact force. The same data you can see here for the case that you have now a constraint case, so the robot actually collides with the, uh, with the, with the wall. Uh, and then again, you can see that the, the case of the, of the, uh, of the uh, design where the transmission is actually elastic and not the cover, uh, it, it produced um, um, uh, most of the effect uh, and the advantage of uh, using the, the impact process. Uh, similarly, as a you can see some effect on the, on the, on the, on the cover or the induction of forces here, but basically producing the transmission point is more than enough and you get most of the advantage in the reduction of the impact process. So uh, let's go now and see a, a, an example uh, in details on a, a series of elastic actuator uh, that we developed in IIT during the European project. Uh, as Ben already mentioned in the beginning about uh, our manual robot and the line of pressure system we use there. And we see the details on the, on the mechatronics of this actuator, but also we see on the, how we use it finally to integrate the, uh, to form the complete manual platform. In particular, we look on, on the, how we perform the tuning on the elasticity. Because one, one, K, one problem is, of course, or one task is to design the robot using and introduce this transmission elasticity. But also, there's another task that is actually uh, um, uh, the tuning of the transmission. And you can imagine that if you have a multi robot with uh, 
uh, all joints having springs and the systematic uh, actuation is uh, uh, helpful in the transmission system in order to get the performance from the robot it, it, it's not an easy task. So as I said, the, the, uh, uh, this work is done within the Mars uh, European project is a, uh, is a project that is actually coordinated by the University of Guildford and uh, the target is actually to, to reach uh, uh, to progress fast and into a uh, rich mode of behavior where we combine uh, novel mechanical solutions like design systems to control and also learning solutions uh, to form a new, uh, new type of robotic systems. Mm -hmm. And within this actually uh, uh, project, we developed uh, the Kovac Manoid, Kovac Manoid, which is a, is, a, is a small scale. For those who know, ICAP is basically the same size, slightly taller than ICAP. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of a follow up project after the end of the, uh, of the, of the RoboCup that developed ICAP. It's, uh, the size is about uh, four and a half meter long time. So it's, uh, now we don't have the head, but the, the robot actually at the shoulder is about 97 centimeters. It has 25 meters of degrees of freedom and it has a little fast compliance in the joints and also uh, additional joint of sensing and, and the uh, possibility to the main active compliance uh, in, in the joints and the end of the so when we start the design, we basically uh, we start with a, this single line specification, which we, was basically to develop a humanoid that can actually physically interact with the environment at a robot level. So we we'll have increasingly active adapter to conduct the impacts and fast reactive, uh, there will be faster reactive performance and robust motivations. These are very different from the videos that we see before, uh, even from the state of the art humanoid, where I, I mentioned that actually that there is a basically a very strict rule on this system that we basically don't allow to touch and all the interaction that will occur between the robot and the environment needs to be pre-planned and well known in advance. So in order to achieve this kind of capabilities, we, we, we um, uh, focus on, on uh, three key design features for this robot. Uh, the first one is actually the, the use of moderate high power capacity actuator. This means that uh, we don't want to only uh, zones that we can generate high torques, but we need to have also high speed in order to be reactive, uh, to execute balancing, and uh, adapt faster to the The second feature is actually the introduction of joint elasticity in, in, in the form of a series of actuator that we saw before, but using a different implementation. And the third one is actually the, the introduction of joint torque sensing that allows us to do active control of the, of the joint dividends um, in, in the robot. We had a number of design challenges, uh, the compact uh, volume of the robot. That we follow basically, as I say, uh, this is actually it was a follow-up project of the, of the ICAP. So we try to follow the same, the same size template. So we start from the original ICAP. And then we try to introduce the, uh, the additional components, which is basically the joint elasticity and also the, the, uh, the reduction of the, of the, of the load set. And this is a very high integration if you want to keep it the, the same size uh, while adding the additional components. And the second actually challenge was, uh, I mentioned also before, is basically, okay, then we design the robot and we can select our springs, but how to select the springs on the joints, and how to do this in, in, a, in a general, using a systematic method in a, at, at, the, at, at the full body level. So we discuss uh, both uh, the design and also the, the, the this tool. So this is Tomar, uh, as it looks now, um, uh, is, uh, as I say, the child size for the hard gear child is, has a moderate high power actuators, use passive sensor compliance in a, a few joints, uh, 14 of the, from the 25, you see in the next slide. So we have an anti knee and hip such that joints on the pit joints of the left, they have sensor assist. The torso pits the forward motion uh, and, and the yaw rotation of the upper bodies of the uh, 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 assist. And the arms, we have the abduction and the flexion and the sensor assist and also the elbow joint. And we have a linear whole cable transmission that they were at the original line. Um, uh, in terms of sensing, we have, uh, as I say, joint torque sensing in all joints. Those that are passive, in this impossible all, all, all also for the stiff joints. Uh, we have a uh, uh, shift of force torque sensors at the feet. Uh, and also we have uh, two IMUs, uh, one is, is placed actually low here at the legs and one is placed up, up to the torso. The system is power autonomous, so it has a battery in the power, uh, power balance in the system. We have two, this one of force. Actually, in this system is only one, the second one will be placed inside of here which is under construction now, uh, and uh, to, to, to control the robot. Uh, and as you can see, the robot is fully covered, so there's actually no internal, uh, uh, no external uh, uh, wiring or cabling, uh, and everything is, is covered by nicely. This is the key of the robot, so uh, 
also uh, shown in the, the degrees of freedom that are actually passing. So, indicated by the red color. I mentioned all, all the pit joints of the legs. They have a seasonal cystic uh, and the two joints of the uh, shoulder, the elbow, and the, and the, and the, and the pits and the jaw of the waist that are uh, seriously last to remember. In total, uh, 14 from the 25 major joints. There are two additional joints for the neck uh, here uh, that are actually steep joints, uh, making uh, that will be used later when we have the, the, the head um, So let, let's give you some details now about the, the, the actuator that we use in the joints. That is based on, on, the, on the combination of the, in the, the... The first part is actually quite traditional, so it's based on the combination of the, of the DC Brasco's motor, uh, combined with the Kaimoti drive, uh, that we, uh, you can see it here. Um, we use frame, frameless motors that we can allow us to, to shape as we like the, the external housing, so basically only uh, the, the rotor and the stator is actually uh, 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 are, are replaced. And then we design all the external <coughs> cells and covers in order to improve uh, uh, the, the, the ability to, to integrate all these components nicely in the rotor body. The output is, is connected to the, to the harmonic drive, uh, with the ratio of that is actually 100 to 1. Um, and, um, and between the output uh, link, the output pulley and the harmonic drive, you can see also the, the top sensor that is installed here, uh, and shown with this yellow uh, color. Now, what is actually the addition to this kind of traditional drive is actually the introduction of this uh, series elastic module that is implemented in a compact manner in the way that you see here. So, uh, uh, basically, the, the principle is actually the blue pulley that you see there, which is actually the, the green one here, is rigidly connected to the output of the top sensor, and, and while the link uh, of the robot, the, the following link after the joint is actually disconnected to the, this uh, three spoke structure that you can see rotating here uh, with respect to the to the, to the fixed uh, blue pulley uh, and the, uh, the coupling is performed with, uh, using the, this uh, three sets of uh, agonistic springs that eventually they, they, they formulate a torsional spring. So this is a very, very, very common uh, um, a modular joint that can actually be used to integrate to, 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 to produce uh, multiple flow systems. Now, for selecting the motor and the, and the harmonic drive, we, we, we follow a, a conservative approach with respect to the motor, in, which means basically we, we size the motor uh, to be uh, at much higher specs in terms of torque capabilities with respect to the, to the harmonic drive. And this allows basically to uh, even for the peak torque that is actually in, in the limit is because of the, of the harmonic drive, to have enough uh, speed capacity also from the motor side. And later you will see some numbers of what you can achieve in terms of speed at the joint of the common, uh, even at the, at the peak uh, uh, joint of This is a, a first prototype in built for this actuator back in uh, 2009, 2009 from now, 2010, uh, that is basically the um, the, the, the motor that you see before, you see the springs here in the output. You see, also combined with active compliance control using the top sensor. But you can see also the effect of the elasticity when actually the, the pressure it impacts the, the link. Uh, and, um, and also the, 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 as you can see during the impact, you can see also the effect of what I mentioned before, that during the hard, the, hard, the very fast impacts, it's very difficult for the control to react. So what you feel actually during this case is actually uh, Basically, the elastic, uh, the intrinsic elasticity of the transmission system. The, the control is always there, but you can see during, during the impact, you cannot actually see any, any reaction uh, because the, the impact is happening in the first two, two, two three milliseconds. And the delay that you have from the sensing part that also the controller uh, does not allow you to have this uh, uh, reaction that you see when uh, the, 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 the perturbation is low, as you see in this case. Here you can see some of the dimensions. Uh, some additional details, uh, again, the, the principle of the, of the torsional springs. This is the stiffness. The stiffness, is because of the, of the mechanism, is not actually stiff, uh, sorry, fixed, but it, it drops with the, with the, with the, with the deflection. Maximum deflection you get is like 0.2 radians, and you get a, a, a drop that is about 7% of the stiffness, following this curve here. You can store also some energy, but as I would say, there is more. I mean, the main purpose that we reduce this compliance is not actually to store energy. So, uh, of course, you have some ability. You can see here the numbers: 1.5 to 2 uh, that, uh, for uh, for uh, fully uh, fully compressed uh, springs. But uh, as uh, we'll discuss later, uh, you will see that this is a very very small amount to consider that you can actually recycle this and, and improve energy efficiency. Um, 
the steel joint is basically the same actuator, but in a way excluding the series elastic part. So uh, basically, that now we replace the output fully you know, the, uh, that includes the, the, the strings, the module, uh, with a fixed uh, rigid uh, component that connects directly to the unit. So it's very, very traditional. This is the, the, the legs of the product, and uh, uh, the pneumatics are kind of, I mean, it's not a promoter, you have a flexion and traction at the, at the, at the, at the, at the, at the heat level, you have the rotation of the tie here, and then the, uh, the knee, the knee flexion, and two additional degrees of freedom for the dorsal uh, flexion and, uh, and the abduction of the, of the anti. And uh, you can also spot here the location of the fourth accessor. And, uh, and, uh, and on, the, on the picture on the right, you can see the two legs together. Uh, they all assemble the lower body. Now moving up to the, uh, and since some of the specifications that we get from, from this design, uh, is, and also some details on the implementation, uh, the hip joint is implemented like a, a kind of uh, um, uh, can deliver beam matching where basically, okay, the first, the first, the first degree of freedom is actually this, and this implements the, 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 the bits of the, of the joint, while the abduction is, is, is implemented by, by, inactivated by, by this second motor that transmits uh, the torque around the, uh, the axis, the, the center of the hip joint through this uh, four bar mechanism. So the, actually this motor is placed lower at, uh, from the hip level and transmitting through this four bar mechanism the, the, the torque uh, around this uh, axis here. Here you can see some of the numbers that I mentioned before, what performance we get from the robot. Uh, and uh, and uh, you can see that we can reach actually very high speeds compared to the quad transition you see in the human systems, but also robots in general, even at uh, quick torque. Uh, so it of course depends on the, on the supply voltage built on the robot, but actually for the full uh, uh, range of voltage you can supply the remote drivers of 48 volts, you can reach like uh, speeds that can go up to 9 radians per second at uh, peak torque at 55 uh, in total. This is actually a big power that corresponds to about four, uh, half kilowatts uh, per zone. So the, of course you cannot keep it this continuously, you can uh, uh, use it for uh, a very short uh, time instances that where you need to have a fast reaction. Uh, but still, you use some additional capability that allows you to do very fast uh, adaptation and, uh, and achieve uh, good performance uh, during balancing and critical and uh, control tasks that require uh, speed. I think I ran out of battery, so I can do it. Uh, so, looking at the knee, is, um, here we see the, the how it's implemented. This is, uh, the knee is placed actually uh, directly on the knee. Uh, the motor is directly on the mid zone. Uh, again, you can see the implementation of the, of the springs, and the, the performance is very, very similar. Uh, to the, uh, the motors basically are, uh, are modular, so we use the same motor for every, every zone, and just save it to, uh, uh, to, to, to fit it inside the space uh, while at the end of the zone. So the performance you get in terms of spin, the top is similar also for the zone. Going down to the, to the, to, to, to the angle. A uh, similar idea uh, for the, like the heat, we use the four bar mechanism, the, the first motor is actually relocated a bit higher uh, to, to move the center of mass of the lower leg uh, towards more on the, on the knee, so may, basically making, uh, 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 reducing the inertia of the leg, which is also important if you want to achieve uh, uh, faster <coughs> performance. Of course, you cannot do much if you have such a modular design, but um, uh, what we did here is basically trying to, to relocate the, the, the uh, the first motor that is, uh, is doing the abduction of the end towards the knee in order to move uh, upward the, uh, the, the center of mass of the, of the lower leg. Uh, the second motor is directly uh, activating the, the, the pit zone that is actually in the center of the end zone. Performance is similar, again, the same motors are uh, used for this zone. Moving up to the waist, the upper body, uh, uh, here we see the implementation of the, of the of the, of, the, of the waist, uh, the series elasticity on the piece on the pit joint on, on the left, uh, and also we have the, uh, the top joint, the jaw joint that is rotating the upper body to be the same module of the series elastic component. Um, while the, the third degree of freedom that is forming the, the role of the upper body is actually stiff up there. The upper torso is uh, the best forms is the main unit, I mean, the main part of the body that uh, includes the, uh, the shoulder motors, the, the first degree of freedom, the flexion, and, and also includes also all the, all the processing units, the PS104, but also the, power, the battery and, and, and power management system. 
And uh, in addition, it has also the components that are related to the neck actuation. So we have uh, two uh, small actuators at the top of the shoulders that actually uh, 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 implement a, a parallel um, uh, neck mechanism uh, to provide the, the pits and, and, the, and the roll of the, of the, of the head. When the degree of freedom uh, which will perform the job, the neck will be housed inside the, the head motor. Here you can see some, I mean, a bit of the a test we did to evaluate the, uh, for how long we cannot last with the, the battery. So we did this uh, very light duty squat, uh, and we uh, with a fully charged battery that uh, basically uh, become flat uh, after two, two hours and 30 minutes. So, I mean, this is, is it always difficult to say for how long the battery will last. Um, in fact, actually, in this case, most of the consumption is uh, coming from the P104 rather than from the, from the current required actually for, for the motors, since the, the torques are actually very low. Uh, as you can see, depending on the needs, not very, very much, so that they will go uh, high torques. Uh, the arm uh, currently is actually a 4 only 4 degrees of freedom. We uh, have a serious elastic at the shoulder, 2 degrees of freedom at the elbow, and we are actually designing a wrist and hand that will be integrated soon. Uh, here you can see the forearm. And while for the, for the hand, uh, we adopt actually a hand that was developed originally in, in, in Bristol Pisa in collaboration with IIT. It's called the Pisa IIT soft hand, that is uh, it basically it, it is a hand that it, it implements the first uh, grasping synergy of the human hand. Uh, it's activated by, by similar servo motor that is uh, and a, a temporal transmission system that goes through all the joints of, 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 of the hand. Uh, because in, in internal elasticity, you can perform actually very effectively, I don't have a video here to show you, but you can actually find some of them on the YouTube. You can effectively perform a, a variety of uh, grasping and perform to the, to the shape of the object using just a single plate. At the same time, it's very robust, since the, the joints are made not by actually roller joints, actually not by actual joints, but with the rolling conducts, which means that if you have an impact even coming from the side, basically the, the joints are, 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 are dislocated and then coming back after the impact. Removal. So it is very, very robust and also helps our, uh, our let's say, target, which basically is to have this all the physical interaction even at the hand level, uh, executing a robust, powerful manipulation uh, in the environment. So uh, hopefully we are going to have this integrated uh, by this autumn. So we're going to have the complete uh, segment of uh, art and also with a single dof actuated uh, hand uh, developed uh, adapted from the PISA IP soft hand. Okay, so this actually finished the, 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 the description of the mechatronics of command. So let's move to the second task that we had in the design of the robot. Where basically uh, it was how to, do, how to tune the compliance. Of course, first is how to work with laser and uh, how to select the donor compliance. And if you see on the literature and, and actually for uh, uh, the robots, the compliance, the series elastic robots that developed in the past, you see that actually there's no uh, 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 much detail um, on, the, on the, of how this is done in most of the systems. And in most of the cases, what people they do is basically start uh, playing with the series of the joints. They, they try the robot, they get some performance, and then basically stay there, or they try to tune and, and see the effect and so on. I mean, you can imagine that it would be very difficult to do this in a robot like Common, where you already have a 40 degrees of freedom with series of and, uh, and how to and how to start and from what level of compliance to start. So we, 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 we want to do basically to, uh, to see if we can tune this uh, compliance using the most systematic method. And we consider actually two cases, uh, two scenarios that we can actually, or two studies that we can perform. One is basically to validate, uh, induce a simulation to validate for uh, robustness, basically look on the force transmissibility during the impacts to the different joints. And uh, all the second to optimize for uh, bandwidth constraints. Uh, basically, look on the, at the natural frequencies of the system and uh, try to, to set the, at these particular levels, and from this extract the stiffness we need at the different joints. So, we talk about the, the second method. Um, so, as I said, uh, I mean, this is a multi dof uh, mass grip system. It's actually highly linear uh, firing system. We have a, the mass uh, matrix that is always changing during the motion. And you have additional linearity. You see, for example, also the, the series elasticity is not actually a fixed value, but it's also changed in the reflection. So uh, the resonance, basically, the natural frequencies of the system change all the time. And so uh, we use some simplification. So uh, I will discuss more here the, the selection of, of the of the of the, of the leg 
uh, elasticity. So we did some simplification. We consider the upper body kind of uh, uh, sink bodies of basically arms, and, and the upper body will consider as a sink mass. And then we, we use this reduced model to, to, to tune uh, to run on simulation and, 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 uh, and tune the, the stiffness. As I said, the, the natural frequency change. So we, what we did, for example, we, um, uh, in order to see how this is changed, we, 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 we select um, uh, uh, one, one, one gate cycle and uh, we, we select uh, a number of uh, uh, 20 basically discrete uh, configurations of this uh, transition. From, from, uh, from the stand, from dump support to, to, to the single support and again to the dump support. And then starting from the, from the uh, uh, compliant zone dynamics that can be described by this equation here, uh, some, some change of variables uh, and some simplification that includes also the, um, uh, the reduction of the gravity effect on, 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 on the stiffness of the robot. We end up with the, uh, a system that is actually in the form of a, a string mass system where the actually the stiffness matrix is a combination of the system of this plus the effect that comes from the from the gradient of the of the of the, of the gravity vector that also acts like as a stiffness also. So this actually system actually uh, you can uh, as I say is in the form of a string mass system. You can even include the uh, KM gain there which basically it describes a single proportional action from the controller. And you can study this as uh, for each of these uh, discrete uh, uh, configuration points and, and analyze the, the, the natural frequencies. So you can derive the natural frequencies of the system. And then having this actually uh, uh, derived, you can, uh, what we did, we actually inform a, a constraint optimization problem where basically the, um, the purpose is actually to, to maximize the joint mass deflection, basically to, to select the most compliant joint, uh, joint uh, 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 the most uh, compliant joint uh, stiffness of the duration that allows to, to set uh, a number of constraints in the natural frequencies uh, and also stiffness constraints. So as a cost function, we, 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 we select this, which is basically the inverse of the energy that we can store in the robot. And we try to minimize. So basically, we try to maximize uh, the amount of energy that we can be storing in the joints I mean, this can be interpreted, of course, as uh, maximizing the, the deflection of the springs uh, or selecting the, 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 the most soft configuration. And then we reduce a number of, of, uh, of, of constraints at the, at the natural frequencies, starting from the first uh, natural frequency, where basically we, we select it on the basis that um, we want to be able to uh, exploit the first natural frequency for energy efficiency, while the, the, the following up the natural frequencies needs to be placed much higher enough so they don't interfere with the first natural frequency. So as you see in the, in the, in the following slide, we, we set the first natural frequency at the, at the order of one hertz, while the, the second one was paid three times higher. And uh, uh, additional constraints included also the some constraints that we have from the, from the stiffness of the set of the joints. Uh, the first uh, minimum stiffness was uh, defined uh, using the principle that we want for the maximum torque that we have on the blind actuator to not saturate uh, 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 the passive deflection. So there's a K mean that uh, for the maximum T, T max you have on the joint, you have to reach the, the, the theta max deflection of the passive deflection spring. So we want to avoid basically to saturate the spring before the, the peak torque at uh, the joint deposit reach. And this is the set for value for the, the K mean. Now the K max was basically uh, a constraint that was set because of the mechanical uh, uh, limitation, the mechatronics and the size of the joint. Mm -hmm. uh, and the size of the springs components that we can set. So this set as a number there that we consider as a, as, as a, as a, as a uh, max value. And as I say, we set the, then the, the first natural frequency to be at 1 hertz and the second natural frequency to be at 3 hertz. And here you can see the, the stiffness of the arm, the, the hip and the, the knee and the hip. Uh, and needed in order to satisfy the, the natural frequency constraints for the, the 20 uh, discrete uh, configuration points. Uh, and uh, selecting the maximum stiffness from, from these curves, then you have a, a set of stiffness for the joints that satisfy the natural frequencies, constraints that you have, uh, and also uh, minimize uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, function here, which basically maximize the energy that you can uh, install in the joints or maximizing the elasticity of the joints. So it selects the configuration at the more elastic. So this is such a the principle we, 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 we use for selecting the, 
uh, the stiffness. And it is nice to see that actually you have progressively increased stiffness starting from the ankle uh, and the knee, uh, 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 sorry, increased stiffness starting from the hip. Knee and so the, 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 the hip is actually it's the ankle, it's carrying kind of lower, the more mass is actually uh, end up with the higher stiffness, and then follows the, the knee and the, and, the, and, the, and the hip. And the same results you can get for the arms, for example, you do similar simulation for the arms, you naturally get something that you actually saw the stiffer, elbow is softer, and the wrist is even more softer. And this is actually the result of natural frequency that we get by selecting the uh, these optimum solutions, and we get the first one and the first one, uh, the second one and the third, and the others are much higher that they, they don't interfere with the action uh, very far from the first one. Okay, now I'll show you some videos of the, of the common. Uh, the first one demonstrates actually the active top control of the, of the robot and the ability to regulate the impedance of the whole body level. Uh, so you can see here that the robot is completely elastic and you, have, you can see different sets uh, uh, stiffness levels are, are the end effectors for the arms and uh, stiffer for the, for the legs, softer for the arms. And the reaction that you see there, of course, is a combination of the active control, but also the series elasticity on, 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 uh, on some of the joints, as I uh, described before. Now here you can see actually you are controlling zero torque at the legs. So basically the, the legs are uh, like a completely bad driver and follow the natural dynamics. Later in the video will be more obvious Before the controller actually starts reacting, 
back of the motion of the robot, the, the pass from lines is performing this natural this effect and reducing the impact. Uh, okay, this is additional videos about basically the stabilization, also the uh, interaction with the child uh, here. Which is actually approximately the same size, you can see it is about four years old. Um, Here, as you see, more aggressive uh, starpasses. This is actually the robot that we currently is installed at EPFL, in the EPFL, um, uh, to maintain the, his balance by uh, stepping at the, at, at, the, at the spot. Even under a very, a very, very rough receiving starpass, you can see the impact on the, on the top here that the robot almost goes to a single leg and it comes back uh, maintaining the balance. You can see the effect of the past lines. All this deflection that we see on the arm during the, the high force impact. Is actually mostly comes from the passive elasticity. Of course, there is active control, you have always active control, but this, uh, this elastic, this from the lines that you get there is actually mostly from the, from the pass, uh, from, from the passive mode. The same uh, uh, effect you can see here on the bottom only with the, the lower body. This video shows the, the robot actually maintaining the balance. Uh, here you can see also the effect of the second strategy I mentioned. So based on the perturbation, the, uh, the lower body actually moves in, in, the, in the direction of the starpass, while the upper body is actually moving in the opposite direction to maintain a set of, of pressure, but also uh, to, to, um, uh, to minimize the, uh, the, the, the angular momentum that is actually produced by the motion of the lower body. So you can see this effect in the, the, the slow motion uh, of the opposite direction of the, of the upper and lower body uh, subsystems. This is so some uh, recent uh, work with common that basically extend, extending now the stabilizer, considering also uh, the previous video that we saw we didn't use at all the IMU system. We use only the first extension of the team. Here we actually integrate also the IMU system to give us a rough estimation of the, of the, of the terrain inclination and also use this inside the control to regulate the cost of the robot. So the performance compromises is 
the more softer you become, the, the more gap you, you introduce between the motor and the road. And then, of course, you produce control issues to how to maintain uh, 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 some of the performance, traditional performance things like accuracy and so on. So, recently, there is a, recently it means that uh, the last 10, 10 years, actually, there is an uh, introduction of uh, an extension of this actuator in the units that can actually <laughs> regulate uh, the, the compliance. Uh, so basically they reduce the series elasticity, but they have the capability to change also the series elasticity, not by active control, but by introducing uh, um, uh, a second actuator in the mechanism that allows to tune the physical properties of the, of the, of the elasticity. So they have the same advantages, obviously it's actually the reputation of the advantages you have in the top, but in addition, you can maintain the performance because you have the ability now to change actually the, the physical spring or the, uh, the transmission elasticity the transmission for a, from a soft range to a, to a, to a hard, I mean, to a stiff uh, level, and uh, basically transform a robot from soft to hard to, to stiff, depending on the task requirements. But they are much more complex, require, require an additional actuator uh, for the middle tuning, so you need a second motor based on a different type of actuator that allows you to tune the, the, the elasticity of the transmission, which means that for every joint you are going to have now two actuators. One will be the, the main actuator of the joint, and the second can be the one that is actually including the elasticity. So you can understand that the quality of the robots uh, using this update can be um, uh, uh, difficult. Here you can see some of the uh, prototypes. Uh, probably the earliest one is this one here that was developed by the University of Pisa. Uh, it's actually the, uh, the, the VSA 1 system, uh, the Barrett Fitness Operator system, then they have uh, other systems developed. There. Uh, they are based on different bridges to we'll go through and uh, see a classification of the type of actuators and how they can be implemented. Uh, I would say mostly Europe is actually is leading the development of these actuators. There was a, a, a European project that ran from 2010 to 2012, so 2008 to 2012, uh, involving groups from DLR, uh, PISA, IIT, Brussels that develop uh, a wide range of these kind of actuators. There are also other groups in the world that are active, like in Korea and uh, in the US. Uh, but I would say most of the developments actually happen inside here. So let's see uh, how they can be classified. So uh, if you consider the, the topologies that you can actually use to, to develop these actuators, they are, you can actually classify uh, as the two main, two main categories. In the first, on the top, you have a, 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 a antagonistic type of actuators that uh, Basically, they, they try to implement the, the, the biological principle of actuation where you have two actuators uh, pushing, uh, pulling, and uh, working antagonistic configuration to our team. So, and you can have also the uh, similar configuration where the transmission system is actually uh, is modulated by a separate small actuator that is placed here, while the big actuator um, is, um, uh, is providing uh, the, 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 the requirements for the motion of, uh, on the job. In terms of uh, regulation principles, it can be classified as a spring preloading. Uh, I, I forgot to mention here that in, order, in any of these systems, in order to achieve the variable stiffness effect, you need all these springs actually to be to have a non-linear natural. So of course, linear natural will not work because even if you pretension, the stiffness will remain the same. So you have to you need to have a non-linear springs because of the this case. So then there are different principles that you can actually use to, to regulate the, the, the stiffness. Starting from the spring preload, in this system you have a non-linear spring, you change the equilibrium point, you have the tension, and effectively you move to a different operating point, and the stiffness is different. You have a variable transmissions where actually the spring can be linear, but you, you have then a transmission from the spring forces to the output link, where you can regulate in order to change the stiffness. And you can have also the modification of the spring properties. For example, there's uh, some, uh, um, let's say, uh, Units that develop based on the principle that you can actually modulate the active coils of the spring. You can actually ground some in, 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 on, on, uh, online in order to change basically the effective level of the active spring and change the stiffness. Here you can see some of the implementations. Of course, you can have non-linear springs implemented in that way uh, using a variable diameter or variable uh, spacing and so on. But it's very hard to model and actually usually uh, uh, difficult to make. So usually people what they do is they use a kind of uh, 
uh, mechanisms that allow us to use linear springs and convert uh, implement these non linear relations between uh, spring deflection and force generated using a number of solutions like the, the CAM system here where you apply the force and you bring it through the, your profile here or the CAM profile, you have a linear spring here and you can produce a non linear force uh, to, 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 to produce a, this non linear force capability. You can have these four bar mechanisms again the same thing. You can produce non linear uh, torque uh, here by having a linear torsional spring here. You have this triangle configuration again uh, uh, using a linear spring, so the, the linear spring and you can pull in one direction and then have a non linear relationship to the deflection and force. You can have, uh, so basically, this, uh, this spring are based on the principle that I, uh, I mentioned before, which is like the spring preloading. The one in the, in the top. Uh, Right, is based on the, on the variable transmission system using the level round principle, where uh, basically by regulating the position uh, of the spring along the level round, you can effectively change the, the transmission of the, of the spring force to the output, and you can regulate the spring. While the last principle on the bottom is, is using this principle of, of modulating the output points of the spring uh, online in order to change the effective level of the spring. And so basically, this is inactive, and this is active. In this case, more is inactive and less, and then you have to change the. the, the uh, the of the so let, let's look at the details also with some examples of these actuators, uh, starting from the antagonistic arrangement, where basically uh, implements the biological principle uh, of the two of the two muscles, two actuators in this case. Uh, you have the, um, uh, the, uh, the two motors to the two nonlinear transmissions to update the joint. Um, and, uh, provide a, an action that is usually uh, unilateral. So basically, the, 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 the muscle can only pull, but they cannot push. So this is the simplest arrangement and has been used a lot uh, in many, many of the implementations. Now, uh, a different actually, I mean, uh, approach is actually to extend this uh, uh, single configuration and loose configuration by adding the third spring that is actually uh, acts like a coupling element between the two motors. And you get a certain advantage from this. Um, if you consider the first actual configuration, this is what uh, so the uh, this configuration will be lateral strings without the spring. You understand that in order to change the stiffness of the joint, the two motors they need always to maintain tension on the springs, which basically consumes a lot of energy. So what is actually this, this uh, additional spring is doing here is basically if you have a, a certain range of stiffness that you can work, you can actually use the, this third element. To, to, to apply the initial pretension of the two springs and release the separate from the two actuators. So if you want to start, for example, from a certain stiffness on the, road, the range of uh, on the joint of 400 Nm per radian, you can select your spring, but you can pretension these springs, the two springs, to be at this range. And then, of course, for higher stiffness, you still need to provide the separate part by the, the actuator. But you remove this initial offset of uh, effort, let's say, to reach the, the minimum stiffness of the joint. So, a, a, a very uh, particular example is actually the, this actuator uh, developed in Pisa. This is the first one, the uh, USA system, that is using, uh, if you remember in the previous slide, using the trial principle to, to implement the nonlinear springs, uh, elastic, the nonlinear transmission. You have the, uh, the linear spring here, the, the pulleys, and another pulley here. And uh, it has two, uh, the two motors uh, uh, here, in the two pulleys, uh, and implements this kind of, of uh, transmission system, you have the two springs, like the normal antagonistic, the single antagonistic, and you have the, the cross coupling spring in order to remove some effort from the actuator. You can see the prototype here, and implement the, uh, the, the spring and the belt system, uh, timing belt system for the connection. Okay. Uh, an extension of this is actually uh, to add additional and first on the single configuration, also this this uh, this uh, called bilateral antagonistic scheme, where basically uh, what is it trying to improve, it tries to, to use uh, uh, the, the the torque from both motors in both directions. Basically, so in the single configuration, we say that actually you can only only uh, um, pull but not push, which means at any time you can actually use only only the, the torque of, uh, of a single motor. Well, by providing this by, by, by lateral coupling with the two additional springs, you can now command and set torques in both directions from the motors, which means you can get double torque output in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the joint uh, using the, the, 
de, de Kababit, es el otro Kababit soporte. Inside, how is the vent? Uh, this is basically the, uh, the main output of the joint, and then you have again this uh, triangle configuration for making. So you have a non linear, linear springs here, which are, are, are connected to this uh, uh, transmission tape transmission system. And then the two motors are here. So the two motors they can rotate and transmit uh, uh, torque to the, to, the, to, the, to the main joint in both directions. At the same time, it can actually work in opposition to stiffening uh, the joint. This is actually uh, a system uh, that is developed inside this European project is a low cost uh, uh, unit uh, that we developed for uh, experimentation and it's not commercial. Uh, it's the first operator that's actually commercial about it. Uh, last configuration that I want to discuss about the metabolistic uh, schemes is actually this that it was used at uh, one of the DLR zones, developed by DLR, which um, basically is called the post metabolistic joint mechanisms. And uh, the difference with the, the single agonistic is actually that it uses two motors, one big one that is case of the joint, and then is a smaller one that is actually allows the tuning of the of the of retention of these springs and also these springs <coughs> in order to change the stiffness of the of the mounting uh, base of the of, of the big motor. <coughs> in, in the implementation is done, if you see here, and it use a uh, they use a harmonic drive where actually the uh, the flex so the lead ring is, is mixed to the stiffness of the spring and, and then all this moves together and you can do the retention uh, of, of the spring uh, also in the other because these are actually the series to take the, the stiffness of the, of the mounting base of the of the big bottom which is then lifted up to the okay so let's see now uh, go and see some details on some of the previous who also developed ID and basically we discuss uh, the extension of this uh, uh, actuator, the compact uh, uh, that we use in compact into a variable stiffness actuator. By looking on the principle that actually the stiffness of the actuator is actually proportional to the level arm, so the level arm is actually the distance from the center of the joint. So basically the idea was actually by modulating, if we can modulate the level arm, we can actually effectively change the stiffness and have a, a, a variable stiffness joint. After this, we also discuss another possibility that we actually provide an additional principle, uh, like a, a physical damage to the joint, and this will be the final part of the action. The, 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 the. But let's start with the level of principle, which basically is like a, a, a variable transmission system, where you can actually, uh, if you consider it consists of uh, this schematic, it consists of two components, you have a lever arm, you have a pivot point of the lever arm, and you have the springs, and you have a phase way to apply the force. If you can actually um, uh, regulate the stiffness in the output point where the force is applied using a, a different, different principles. So starting from the, from the uh, first here, what can be done for example is actually one you can put a second actuator to, to move the springs along the lever arm and then effectively change the, 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 the stiffness in the, in the output. And the stiffness in that case is actually proportional to the square of the lever arm. Here you can see some of the Two examples of actuators, one of them in Korea, and the other one is actually our actuator, which is the ID, which they use the, this uh, uh, lever arm uh, uh, principle with the, uh, uh, locating the, the, the springs in order to, to change the speed. Okay, so how it's done? Here is the schematic. You have the, the main motor, it's actually acting on the pivot unit that is actually easy to connect to the other right. Then you have the two springs that actually uh, have a rollers here, uh, they can move up and down. And you have a second actuator that can actually move these things uh, up and down in this direction. And this, by doing this, you can actually change the effect of the stiffness that you see down the field. Again, here, I'm doing both from the PLS. But I mean, the best way the stiffness is basically the person with the case now, and the exactly square of the lever arm. What is actually uh, important to notice here that actually this actuator is not based, the uh, change of the stiffness is not based on the potential of the springs. So we change actually the transmission pressure. We don't change the pressure of the space. And you see the effect on the energy that is required to change the stiffness of this thing. So this is the, the, the prototype, um, the main actuator. This is the, the intermediate link that is rigid to the actuator. Then we have a, a very traditional, uh, let's say, bosco drive, where basically uh, moves uh, the two springs that are mounted on the nut of the bosco drive using, using the small motor uh, that is placed here. So by locating the springs uh, towards the center, you reduce the stiffness, putting the, the, the springs 
and exactly the same there, the risk is equal to completely doubling this zone from the video thing, while uh, printing them outward up to you can reach a certain uh, steepness that is proportional to the distance of the, the level up from the center to the location of the speed. So basically I can solve this. Uh, and then cover uh, the output thing that can be left and we can uh, have the elasticity in the fast elasticity. Okay. This shows uh, the stiffness uh, relation uh, as a function of the of the deflection, uh, but also as a function of the level up. So when you uh, for different uh, stiffness uh, selection of uh, for different selections of springs, uh, from 50 newton to millimeter to 100 millimeter, and you see how it changes as you increase the, the level up distance. And also you can see that the sound effect uh, is the deflection, so it's actually a function of the actual uh, I mentioned before that uh, one important uh, aspect of this update is actually is that it does not use the, the passive, the, pre the preloading of the spring to change the stiffness, but basically you're locating the spring around the level And this has an effect that you can see that for very small deflection, you actually you don't need energy uh, in order to regulate it. Of course, you need to overcome, you need to run the, the second motor and you need to overcome the friction effects, but you don't need to act against the lower basically. You don't need to act against the deflection as you, as you have in the other risk of situation where any, any uh, any change of the stiffness require a large amount of effort of the two actuators in order to maintain the flow. Uh, and okay, this is some details about the uh, specifications of the actuator and some tracking of the, of the stiffness as well. This is the prototype. Later you see inside the, 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 the this is only done mechanically, so there's no actually active control, there's no blood cell. So you can see the, the, the two springs that actually they move, uh, they're using the second motor in, in and out to change the, the coupling, uh, the coupling between the middle bit, which is this one, and the other bit. Yes. So this is the middle bit connected to the motor, the main motor, and this is the other bit, and the springs actually capture the two together. Of course, that's better than the first piece. You can see that the, the unit is very big. You cannot actually imagine that you can use this in the, in the, in the coma, but even, for, even in bigger serial systems. Uh, and and uh, we try to improve this. We have a, another version that is actually more combat thin. It's actually, I would say, the complex is high to consider. Okay. So, moving to the, to the, the second principle using the level arm. Uh, a different solution is can be actually to, to move the, uh, uh, not the springs, but actually to move the, uh, the, the location of the applied force. So basically the, the springs can be fixed to a, a particular position. You have a pivot point again, that okay, now is on the other side. And then by, by changing where the force is applied, you can actually change the stiffness. So moving the, uh, this point, the force point close to the pivot, you, you increase the stiffness of absolutely. And you move it towards the spring, you get the smaller uh, uh, value. So uh, this effect is implemented actually for an actuator. I have only this map here, I don't have the idea of the actuator. But basically, it was implemented actually in the universe of 20. And, uh, and you can see here how it's done. So you have two actuators, two, one, and two, between these actions. And basically, they change the apparent stiffness of this linear prismatic joint by moving actually this along the, uh, the lever arc, while the spring is kept fixed and how it will go here. So the same for the, uh, the, the stiffness, uh, which is a uh, function of the, of, the, of the distance of the Q1, which will be close to the pivot point and becomes, becomes the structural stiffness. Okay. The third version is basically the, uh, of the level arm principle is basically considers, uh, let's say, uh, fixing the springs in the same location, the force application point is fixed, and what is doing actually move the pivot point. And then in this way, you take basically the, the uh, transmission ratio between the forces that are acting on the spin side and the forces that are between the other side, and uh, changing the speed, uh, the, the effective speed is in the output. So this is how it works. Uh, as I say, this is a high speed space where the pivot point will move toward the outside, uh, upward toward the, where the forces apply, and the speed is decreased. If you move the pivot point closer towards the center, if you move it here, it becomes zero, while moving towards this direction, it increases. What is it good for, for this? Uh, in this case, it's actually you have a, a very large range of stiffness. You start at 
can start from zero basically with the pivot point here, and you can do structural stiffness with the pivot point here. Also, since the stiffness is a ratio between the two, you can actually have a very small lever arm. And the paper that we showed later, you have a lever arm at 1.5 centimeters, which means you can reduce the size. While in the first principle, the lever arm was about 10 centimeters. So you can get a good range of, uh, of uh, stiffness regulation. At the same time, you can actually minimize the actuator of size. And this is the how it's done. Um, so the lever up is basically this. This is this actually the can profile that you see here. This is the pivot point that is actually uh, created by using the rack and uh, So you can see uh, the pivot is here. And then we have the two springs uh, that actually are conducted with the rollers, the, 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 the can profile. And by this is actually the, the, the connection with the output of it. And by relating the, the the pivot point in this one we have from the distance, we go from completely decoupling the link to fully structural. Then this is uh, the, the full assembly of the actuator. So basically uh, we have the main motor here, this is motor M1, this is basically the main drive of the joint. And you can see here the, the second actuator that is actually drives the anti minimum, which is there, uh, in order to regulate the pivot point. Inside the change of thickness, and you can see here the the, the, sorry, the, uh, the rack that is moving with uh, this motor here. Okay, and in this one, I'm going to start the analysis. You can divide the basically the stiffness, and uh, that is, is a function of the uh, delta 1 over delta 2, where the delta 1 and delta 2 is actually two distances from the, from the strings, location okay, of the pivot point and the pivot. Uh, on the, the output uh, uh, where the force is applied, which means that if you, if you, if you bring the delta from the to zero, uh, then the stiffness is going up, you get a structural stiffness, so when you get delta one equal to zero, you get zero stiffness. This is uh, how the stiffness change effect um, on this type of uh, principle uh, as a function of the other arm. Uh, one is advantage that is basically that you see that there is a very sharp rise here, which means you have a very good resolution of, of, the, of, the, of the accuracy of the position of the, of the pivot point in order to get a good uh, performance. Um, uh, the deflection range, you can see there's 1.35 radians, up to a certain uh, around distance, and then it drops down. Here you can see the elastic drop that we produce of this type of actuator. But more important to see that actually the, 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 the top that we are required for the relation of the, of the pivot portal is actually is well below the capabilities of the first operator, which means that you can use a very small motor to adjust the, the stiffness instead of having two equal size motors like in an agonistic scheme. So we use a, a motor that is about the technical meters actually to do the, the work of the stiffness regulation by the actuator reduces the uh, this I some graphs to show the response. The response is much faster now. In the first actuator I show you, uh, we have a response uh, for a uh, minimum to maximum stiffness of like four point, about 4 seconds. Uh, while here we, get a, we have a time constant of about 0.25 uh, seconds, so it's 250 minutes. And this is because basically the lever arm is very small, so you can very fast change the move uh, from low stiffness to high stiffness, while in the other case you have to travel 10 centimeters to change the, the uh, from, to go from the minimum stiffness to uh, the high stiffness. This is the prototype. Uh, we have the here. Um, this is the actuator. More compact now, but still actually you see that most of the space that the actuator is actually occupied by the, by the, the mechanism of the related stiffness. So it's adding almost double the weight of the main actuator. So this is going to happen with the, the people fully attracted. So you can complete the cap uh, This is the rack that you can move after the change of stiffness. And the, main, the second model is actually here.
to, to, to provide energy to the, to the central model. So here you can actually one can follow two strategies. One is basically to say that okay, I have a varying trajectory, but if, if I, I know the, the, the parameters of this trajectory, I can possibly do a pre-tuning and find the, the optimum stiffness, the minimum stiffness, sorry, the, the, the stiffness level that provides me the most efficient operation for executing this trajectory. This is the first strategy. Or the second strategy can be that the, the, the stiffness can be tuned based on the frequency of in real time. So all the time the second actuator works, it changes the basically the the, the stiffness of the joint and, and minimize, basically matching the natural dynamics of the system all the time with the, with the, with the varying frequency trajectory. So here you can see basically what you get from ours, uh, uh, where uh, the, on the, on the, on the red line shows basically the, the energy consumption executed in this uh, trajectory uh, using the, the fixed stiffness strategy that we, we found basically by running inside the system in, in different frequencies uh, with the varying, varying frequencies and then finally the one that minimizes the energy. And the second uh, strategy shows for different stiffness with these blue lines, of course, uh, when the, the frequency of the trajectory match the, uh, the, um, the, the frequency of the, of the, of the, of, of, sorry, the, the natural dynamics, you get the, the minimum here. And we have a system that proves that actually the, the second strategy basically varying the, the stiffness of the time in real time, is actually allows to reduce the, uh, the energy more. Uh, and this is because uh, basically the, the stiffness motor is also for some energy. And this is given by, basically by, by the same idea. So uh, the line formed by the minimum for its stiffness and the, and the, and the line uh, that is, is uh, related to the optimal stiffness, uh, the area in between basically gives you the energy that is actually for some by the stiffness motor for the regulation. Now this is, was actually the case for the others, where the stiffness regulation, as I saw in, in the previous graph, in the previous graph requires minimum energy because the, the principle is not based on, on the on the on the on the preloading of the spring but it's changes on the variable. But it's not the case for other actuators we need when we need to actually to apply high forces or higher from, from the actuators in order to regulate the spring. Okay. So this is the, the second So let, let me uh, do a summary now about this energy and also to do some other limitation of basically prevents to demonstrate that this kind of actuators can be used for energy efficiency. I mentioned already that uh, energy capacity is limited, so you have only a few joules. I mean, in our actuator, we have a, a about two, two and a half joules that we can store in the joint, and the best performing uh, variable stiffness actuator that is outside now is basically the DLR joint that can store 4.5 joules. So this is the, 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 the energy that we can store. It's, it's very small. Uh, the deflection is very small. It means that if you come to, uh, to to exploit using natural dynamics, large trajectories, you need to move the actuator. You cannot do it by just oscillating along the natural trajectory. The gear limit is very high still. So the actuators actually, although they, they introduce the passive elasticity, they are still based on, on, on traditional design principles. So they, they have high gear limit, which means large actuator inertia. And actually, the, the main element that consumes the energy is simply moving the motor itself, not actually moving the link, but actually moving the motor itself. And this is high, actually. So basically, um, the actuators are not possible to provide or to store enough energy in order to, to, to compensate for the energy needed for the, for the large actuator inertia. Uh, to have uh, uh, additional mechanical components means that if you do the comparison, if you want to do a real comparison between the fishes, you have to compare equivalent stiff actuator that you can do, that the, the, the first actuator that you have in the joint that basically have a certain mass inertia, and then add on top all the, all the additional mass that you have to, to add to the actuator in order to implement the variable stiffness. And you will see that actually you can almost double the, the mass of the actuator by adding these components in most of the designs that you have seen so far. And you should, you should, you should take this into consideration when you, you do the, the, the evaluation of the, of the efficiency. You are going to end up with a, a much higher uh, weight uh, robotic system with higher masses and inertia that would require higher torques in order to perform the same trajectory that you can do with a stiff case. And in addition, the last point is basically in many of these actuators, because of the elasticity, you have induced oscillations that you have to implement a certain damping, uh, active damping control actions in order to compensate. And this, of course, are saturated because of the main actuator is consuming even more energy to, to, to achieve the accuracy that you can do in the active system. So basically, uh, the conclusion uh, is basically that it would be very difficult to demonstrate energy, energetic effects, efficiency effects, uh, with this type of actuators due to this type of, uh, of limitations. A simple example of common, we did this actually squat motion 
for common. Okay, it has a series of elastic joints at the, at the, at the here and here. And we try to do this on the, on the, I mean, we play for different frequencies, up to one, one, one hertz, which is actually the first natural frequency. And we observe I and mean, we measure the, the electrical power. Although this is a simulation, we have uh, accurate models of the operators, which means that we can do also current uh, measurement of the simulation. Uh, and, um, uh, and we, we estimate the actual energy consumed during this motion for the different joints. And you can see, for example, here for the mid joints, okay, this is for both legs, so you get an average, let's say, 775 joule per leg for, for performing this motion. Now, if you compare this with, with, with what we can store actually in these joints, which is like, as I say, 2.5 uh, joule, you, it's very obvious that actually you cannot actually do much. Um, so, Basically, we need the actuation system that we can st store much more energy inside. We have the use of uh, actuator inertia, um, which implies also lower gear uh, at, uh, at the main actuator side and large passive detections. Okay, so I think we have still time, yes? Maybe 10 minutes? Yeah. Basically, 10, 10 more bytes, I think. Yeah. So, okay, last, last part. Uh, is to reduce some uh, some work with uh, also on the extension of these uh, stiffness based actuators to, um, to uh, actuators are adding additional physical principles as a variable physical value. So basically, we took the the cobalt actuator and we add the 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 uh, other mechanisms that are the physical value parallel to this. Now, why we do that? Actually, this comes also in punishment for humans, which were basically our mass are not actually only springs, but also they are also dampers. So they provide physical damping. There's some implicit damping on the mass that actually provides uh, physical damping on the for one of the oscillations. And this is very, very low en uh, energy consuming because this is natural and this is physical damping that, uh, component that's actually in the mass. But actually, during volatile motion, we, 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 we regulate the damping. Uh, uh, proportion to the stiffness and somehow matter in reverse of the, of, the, of the velocity. So we have also some damping, active damping regulation uh, in, in, in our masses. So uh, the idea is here basically to, in order to assist the control of this uh, series of elastic joints, it's actually introduce a matrix of the physical damping that you can actually regulate. It. So you can have it there or remove it depending on the, on the, on the requirements. And uh, basically, uh, Care to uh, on the control and achieve the performance and the precision and uh, increase that uh, bandwidth for high bandwidth, which can be up as a solid in connection, so basically becomes a stiff, stiff system uh, and also, uh, as I say, compensate uh, assist for the regulation of the This is a valid physical damage operator uh, example that we developed in IIT uh, uh, with the purpose of uh, automation to, to assist the control of the precision of the joints. The principle is actually a kind of uh, semi-active solution to the same data, and it produces in parallel to the spring a, a, a physical damping component. Mm -hmm. Here is how it's done. So the actuator is basically a combination of the, of the damper plus the compact actuator that we're using for that. And uh, it, it was implemented by using this uh, friction brake system, which is composed by the two surfaces here, uh, actuated by uh, piers of stack actuators. Uh, there are four piers of stacks. Uh, Around the, the, the pulleys that act on the, on the red, the apply forces on the red the element that is acting against the, the, uh, the ring, the, which is acting the ring. And by making actually the, the forces of these piers or modules on the, on the basis of the, of the oscillation velocity, you can actually, although this is a friction damper, a friction break, you can actually implement the effect of physical damper by, uh, by controlling the, the, the force on the basis of the velocity of the oscillation. We can see here a video where that's the, the, the here we don't have yet the, the main actuator of the joint, so it's, it's basically a spring mass system where we apply the physical damping and we regulate it. So it basically we, we externally perturb and we leave it to oscillate on the natural frequency, and then we regulate the damping and we close the loop to regulate it in certain time duration in our beginning. <coughs> Okay. 
again here, so some additional details. Now we have also in the data creators, so in the creators actually perform a step, a step uh, uh, profile, and, and of course, they have to uh, cause the, the, the induced oscillations, we have to link and then we regulate. You can actually eventually move, work at the resonance. You can see the passive deflection uh, when the system is at the resonance, and you can see uh, the bit of this. Uh, you can see also the effect on the uh, when the damping is applied. But, um, the video is looking very good. Okay, here you can see the when the damping is applied, so it can minimize the, the oscillation amplitude. Now we have actually uh, uh, transformed this to a modular uh, joint that you can see here, and actually constructed a physical arm uh, manipulator that is, is based on the actuator principle that is. Uh, Composed by the series elastic plus physical garment. Uh, we call it the compact PPDA manipulator. Uh, it's composed of two different modules, as I say, it manages actually the longitudinal and the compressor that using these two we form uh, four joints. So we have the shoulder and the elbow at the moment. Um, uh, here you can see some videos, and I will close with this. This is mostly the pascal assist that you see that there's not the control. But uh, then you, by using the active dumping, you can actually effectively also uh, uh, be accurate and perform uh, following trajectories, uh, minimizing the effect of the In the common, we use, you see you integrate in, in most of the major joints. So we have all the big joints which are major for the legs, for example, where the abduction we, we left it out. For the, for the we left out the, the rotation here, but we have the, the two main joints of the, of the shoulder and the, also the elbow. And also for the, for the, uh, for the waist, we have the new motion mostly because we have a, uh, if you have positions from the front, you can, even if you are a similar configuration for the arm, you can still have, have some compliance, and uh, also the pits. Uh, but I mean, the selection of the location depends. I mean, you can uh, eventually put it known if you, you have the available space. Uh, I mean, the design of the common, if you had some, the, the main limitation for us that why we didn't put it in other joints was mostly because we want to really keep the, the size of the ICAR uh, But with slight increase of the size, you could be, 
possibly to have it in all zone spaces. Is it useful for, for, all, for all joints? And there are certainly ma some that are, are more major. As I say, the pits of, of the legs are more, more important. But uh, I, would say, I would say that we have also situations with attraction, we can have also, also collisions. But I would say mostly the pits are. That's why we select with the limit size we have, then we select only the pits rather than going also for the attraction. For the are you familiar with the Baxter robot by Yes. Can you offer any insight as to the different, because they've got compliance built into that robot itself. Can you offer any insight or comparisons between the two systems? As far as I know, the, the Baxter is also based on, on, on this elastic operation. Uh, I don't know details about the, how the mechanism is implemented. Certainly, given the price of the robot, I, I, I would expect that it's actually uh, the, the I would say the, not the quality, but they say the, the components or the implementation would be something very cheap that can be based on, on, uh, on uh, difficult to say actually how thing, but, but just from the price, I can imagine that certainly the, 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 the motors they use would be probably low quality, the, the implementation of the series elastic would be based, maybe based on the simple beam principle or very, very simple mechanism that give you the elasticity without many components that will increase the price. But I don't know details about the design. So your system, um, by extension, that's very expensive at the moment. Here we use, uh, I mean, the, the, of course you can implement also cheaper, but here we, get, we need to get the performance. We, we use high quality drives uh, that are, are, are um, uh, also the, the reduction drives are based on harmonics, which are very expensive. I suspect that we we'll use plant ideas where they say one tenth of the price and uh, lower, lower quality models and also the implementation of the series clusters will be Lower, lower number of components and so on, which is, but uh, I, 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 it's only thought, only I don't know the details about it. Okay. okay, so could you give a ballpark figure for the cost of the uh, For common? Yeah. Okay, so the, the, um, the cost, I will tell you the, 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 the cost for fabricating and building the robot, including, you say, the, uh, the, the labor of work, let's say, for the assembly, would, is about uh, 170, 180,000. Um, certainly, this is a cost for a simple prototype. There are things that we can do to reduce it. I mean, presently, we start investigating the components uh, to reduce the cost. Um, uh, let's say, trying to, to get uh, the case components uh, for uh, harmonic drives that are custom made for us. You can reduce a lot of cost also. There are motors now that reach very close to the performance of the motors we have there, which you can get it from like 40% uh, of the price. Again, this will not go cut, cut a lot because probably will cut a couple of tens of thousands for the actuation. Um, uh, also, another thing that is expensive is basically the, the components. Basically, I mean, we, we now we are building a single unit every time, and this is very expensive. I mean, if you have a big numbers, you can drop the price, but, but uh, building one robot every time is, is, is expensive. And um, if if you could show, like, if I remember the video where initially you showed the um, reaction to disturbances with just using the, the compliance of the joints, then uh, people were pushing the robot side to side and it was uh, balancing very nicely. Then uh, in a later video, you showed where uh, it was additionally adding additional steps, basically recovery steps in order to recover from a push. But when I looked at those videos, the, the pushes seemed to be identical and it seemed to work a lot better with just using the compliance than the, than the push recovery steps. You mean the, the like I know in humans it basically is a matter of the, the amount of uh, push and recovery that is, uh, needs to be done. So this one is strategy. So you talk about the video of the first videos that was only the first one. Actually, the, the last video, if you go back, uh, the video that showed the push recovery steps where you were adding additional steps into the recovery. So there was a video of the, of the, uh, the lower body only? Yeah. So there was the first video, I mean the first prototypes videos that we, we 
we have the push from the front and from the side, yes. And then the conversion with the video from that the comparison was where the robot was actually taking additional recovery steps okay. rather than just using the compliance. Yes. When it was doing the additional recovery steps, it looked to me significantly more unstable than when it was just using the compliance. And yes. the amount okay. of but perturbance the, seemed to be the, about the same. The, I mean, the, 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 this is the different reaction of strategies. Of course, as humans, we can actually do as, as much as we can. If somebody pushes and maintain the balance by just doing post modulation, then you can do this. So this was demonstrated in the, in the first early videos. But there are certain levels that if, you, if, I, if the disturbance is very strong, then you have to take an action. You have to move the right. back or in the direction of the disturbance. So um, although the, uh, the, the, so the second part that we showed the stepping strategy, of course, is more, more, more unsta I mean, less stable because the robot has to move. Basically, at the same time, you need to take a step in the direction of the pressure of the in the first case, the, what, the only thing that it's doing is basically modulating the body posture. So it has a, a fixed uh, support polygon and basically regulating uh, the, the center of pressure and the posture to maintain the balance in, right, within right. the spot. While in the second case, it goes to a seam support and needs to take a step, which means when the step also is placed on the ground, you have a, this is a relatively also fast reaction that you have impact force that you can also increase the shape of the robot. So, but, but they, they, they demonstrate different principles. At the, yeah, end, at the end, the this needs to be combined, basically. Okay. So depending on the level of compliance or sort of the, of the, of the disturbance, you, you actually you activate the post modulation strategy without taking any step. If it's something very strong, you need to take a step. But certainly, of course, it's more a step because you need to do different things. You go to a single leg, you have then to place the leg, you have an additional disturbance that comes from the foot and the ground uh, conduct uh, between the foot and the uh, And this makes the, the uh, add to the system the additional external forces that he can be, uh, make it more unstable, let's say. Let's go if we, uh, now I, I, I do this lot at the moment, actually. But the main difference is basically, yeah, I mean, we are different. At the end, we, our plan is basically to combine the two. The difficulty is how, how to trigger one or the other, actually. How to take it, a selection, because simply looking on the disturbance is not enough. I mean, it depends on the overall state of the robot. If you can activate, uh, stay on the post modulation or, uh, I would say predict what would be the best strategy to take a step because post modulation will not will not uh, 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 stop me from falling. Let's say uh, so combining the two, also combining with the, the locomotion. This is actually a, a hard uh, how to set the basically the trigger levels for, for the different strategies for different controllers, which yeah, there are kind of standalone. So the, there are kind of primitive reactions that you have in the robot and you have to activate it depending on, on the input from the external. Input. Yeah, I find um, these uh, disturbance uh, reactions uh, very impressive. Uh, but in soccer, at, at one point, uh, the robot will fall. So it's, it's very clear that falling is part of the game. And you mentioned that uh, the compliance uh, between the, like the link and the, the actuator um, is uh, robust to impact. So uh, would, would you say it's, it's possible to to have the robot falling on, on such a carpet? I think, I mean, okay, Coma has fallen actually three times. I mean, it's possible to have it falling, but yes. uh, then maybe uh, <laughs> no, the no. key operation will <laughs> survive it. Okay, but, uh, so far we have the three falls, bad falls of Coma actually. It's completely it's must on the ground. Actually, once was like the robot is starting and somebody stopped the controller while the robot and it like uh, go down, and the other two was basically left handed without the hands and fall down. But in three, in three cases, survive. I mean, we didn't have any damage on the actuators first, on electronics, but we have a big damage on the covers, actually. So we have broken covers, and, 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 uh, but not actually a serious problem. Of course, I mean, okay, this happened in three cases, maybe another case that would be... I would say that the, the actuator uh, uh, size would be quite robust, actually. It would not be a problem, at, at least for the serious lasting joints. Then it's a case also, not only a matter of actuator, but it's also, I mean, all the electronics are placed around the legs. So you need to nicely protect it. Okay, we have not placed much effort on common on this. They are protected by the cover. They survive in these three times, but certainly, I mean, always a risk. Yes, I mean, uh, yeah, I this is only the experience we had. I had the, uh, yeah, three really bad forms with common. And I mean, the robot is not light. It's like 30, 31 kilograms. So it was like it's past the ground and completely destroying the, the torso here. Uh, but not major, major problems. We have to repair it, we have to put new covers, yeah, yeah. but uh, no major problems with the actuators or other things. Uh, so 
what you take is the weakest part. So the bracelet is like uh, playing soccer. It falls three times, the fourth time it breaks. Which part does it break? More likely. More likely to break. So which, which part do we have to actually make better? Mm -hmm. the, Okay. I mean, what, what we are missing in common and it's actually uh, going to work is actually to improve the, 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 the absorption of impact, the impacts at the cover, actually. Um, okay, this will require complete uh, change, probably the robot will not gonna look as nice as it looks now. Uh, but we basically, the principle is based on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a type of, let's say, net of, of uh, uh, metal net combined with a soft material. Uh, embedded inside, it. so the metal net is inside actually with the, with the, with the soft material outside. I mean, no, sorry, the soft material, the, the metal net is embedded inside the soft material. So you can form the, the shape and you can have a soft uh, component. Uh, so this is certainly uh, something that we are missing in Goma if we are talking about Goma and the, and the robot is very weak on this. I can say any fall collision, you, you, you risk to break the cover. Um, now, in the, the joints, as I said, we did have major problems so far. We have the uh, two robots, one in IIT, one is actually a TPFL, but is running alone, you know, any, 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 any repair for the last seven months. So they have it there. Uh, the only issues they have from time to time was uh, mostly the, uh, some connector problems inside. They have to open one cable to fix uh, some, some cabling, but, but they didn't have any mechanical problem for the, and the, the robot is delivered in last November there and is running okay for seven, eight months now. And I would say with quite a severe, let's say, uh, use. So they, they, they try to do some uh, human-like walking with the shoe strike that impose high torque to the joints. And, and also, uh, they didn't have fall so far. Uh, so I would say quite robust. I mean, uh, the, the, the more, the weakest thing actually I could, you know, I, you know, on now is basically the, how to, to reduce the impact that goes from the, to the cover and then, of course, to the structure by changing this to, to something that more soft and uh, like, like an absorber to this. So it's like the instruction mm -hmm. inside will change? No, the instruction inside will not change. We didn't have any, any problem at all in the tool also, about breaking harmonics or destroying motors or things like that. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Um, I guess that these um, motors must be relaxed in order to change the uh, stiffness of the strut or you mean the uh, you, can, you mean to you need to in order to change the stiffness you need to have no load in the link? Yes. No, I mean, no, it can be changed also uh, uh, actually, but no, can be changed in any load condition. So you can uh, push it so that the strings are not relaxed and then change the Yes, it's good, it's good. so you can actually have a reloading on the speed because of the external force, mm -hmm. and then use a second motor to adjust the stiffness. Of course, if, if, the, if, the, if the external force stays in, in, the, in the same level, this will change the equilibrium because the stiffness will increase, will change. But you can do it in any low other conditions, yes. You don't need to relax. Mm -hmm. Are there any additional challenges with compliant joints with sensing? Compliant joints with sensing? Yes, so, that, like so if you want to know the position of a compliant joint, are you still relying on an encoder? Or how, how okay. do you in, common, in common, the compliant joints, they have three encoders. We measure the, the motor side, so this before the gearbox. We use the, the location, uh, we use the, the, uh, another encoder that is absolute, uh, after, the, after the gearbox, immediately after the gearbox. We need also an absolute encoder that measures the speed reflection. So we know all information, plus the toxins. So we have full state measurement of the joint. Yeah, I think this is the last question given the, the advancement of the time. So, uh, for a typical variable elasticity setup, uh, what's the ratio of the weight of the motor with the variable impedance setup? So, typically. <laughs> difficult to say. Okay, uh, let's say how much mass is added, let's say, to, to the system if you want the uh, variable stiffness part. Okay, I, I can say from only for other systems and the come up to say, I have, I mean, the numbers to say. So the, the actuator um, uh, of ABAS without the, the, the module, or even the compact PSA without the module on the top, uh, it weighs about uh, 0.9, 1 kilo, 0.9, 1 kilogram, and adding this, it goes to 1.7. So half of the weight is added, or the it's same weight is added again for the... So this is what I say, I mean, you, really, you, you, you are going to end up with a system that will increase a lot of the mass, and the energy efficiency is not, uh, I mean, this increase is underestimated, let's say. 
Yeah, so I would like to suggest to continue the discussion during the coffee break and uh, yeah, reconvene 10 minutes after the uh, prior to the hour, so 10 minutes uh, to 12. Uh, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.